In this session, I would request uh, Sri Prakash Singh, former DG Uttar Pradesh and Assam, and former DG Border Security Force, to take the chair for this session, sir. He shall have the baton with him and uh, conduct the entire session. Amongst the other speakers, I would call upon Vice Admiral Pradeep Korshiva, former Director, National Maritime Foundation. Kindly come and occupy your seat, sir. Uh, I would request all the gentlemen sitting out here to just put their hands together. It will just warm them up. It's really cold with the air conditioners and it will warm up the air too of all the speakers too. <laughs> Uh, shall call upon Air Marshal Ramesh Rai, former Commander-in-Chief, Training Command, Indian Air Force, Ministry of Defence, Government of India, to come on the dais and occupy the seat, sir. <laughs> Next, I call upon Dr. Pankaj Gupta, Executive Director, Centre for Ethics, Spirituality and Sustainability at Opi Jindal Global University, Sonibad, formerly with IMT, IIM. Uh, kindly come and occupy your seat, sir. He's uh, not here? Yeah, he's coming. All right. I'm told that he's arrived, but he's, he'll take a little while to come here. Next, I shall call upon Dr. J.S. Sodhi, Vice President and CIO, MIT Education Group. <laughs> Welcome, sir. One of our speakers, Major Gaurav Arya, who most of you would like uh, would have liked to listen to. I understand he's not keeping uh, well, so he'll not be able to come and join us here. Uh, last but not least, I shall call upon Marana Mahmood Madani, who is a member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha, and General Secretary Jamaate Ulama Ehin. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, we begin the afternoon session now, and uh, we have a distinguished panel of speakers. Because the overall theme is combating terrorism, analysis, and response. Uh, the panelists would throw light on different aspects of terrorism uh, from their respective points of view. I have also been asked to speak on whether they are whether we are prepared for the next challenge. Apart from that, uh, we have uh, uh, Vice Admiral Pradeep Koshiva, former director of the National Maritime Foundation. I'm sure he would throw light on coastal security, which is uh, very vital for uh, our security, considering that 2611 happened because of the chinks in our uh, coastal security arrangements. We have a huge coastline and uh, whether that is adequately secured or still there are gaps which could be exploited is a matter of uh, serious concern and I'm sure the Vice Admiral would throw light on that. Uh, we also have Air Marshal Ramesh Rai. There, there are certain aspects uh, from the Air Force angle also. The use of drones, use of uh, other surveillance uh, equipments which are available now. And of course, some aerial support is required uh, in anti naxal operations and, in, and generally you can say in counterinsurgency. I'm sure Air Marshal Rai would be throwing light on that. Then we have uh, Mr. Sodhi. Uh, he is uh, an expert on cyber security, which is, uh, which is very, very important. In fact, recently a global conference uh, has been held recently. And uh, the threat of cyber security is, is assuming very, very, very alarming proportions because uh, this is something which, has, which is being daily used 
and its use is expanding at a very, very fast rate. All our transactions are uh, uh, online and so much of uh, communication network and defense installations, they're all, they're all through medium where cyber terrorists uh, are, could, could penetrate and could cause havoc. So that is also a very important uh, area. We have uh, Marana Madni with us, who is one of the liberal Muslim leaders of the country. And uh, we need more Muslim leaders like him because his is a moderate, because his is a moderate voice. And one of the greatest problems uh, with the Muslim community as a whole, I would say, is that they, while the extremists are able to articulate and express their views and are very vocal about uh, whatever views they hold, the moderate, el the moderate elements generally prefer to remain quiet because I mean, most of them are afraid of antagonizing the ext extremist sections and inviting the ire and opposition of the uh, community. But uh, Maulana Madni is a moderate, uh, is a moderate voice, and he has been expressing his views on different issues uh, with great courage and with great conviction. Now I'll introduce the subject briefly, and uh, while introducing the subject, I will also uh, say whatever I have to say on the subject. You see, <coughs> talking of terrorism, we have to remember that this is the greatest threat. He represents the center of center for ethics, spirituality, and sustainability. Uh, I have only passed through O.P. Jindal Global University during the inquiry which I conducted in the Haryana Reservation Agitation, but I was told it's a very prestigious institution, and, uh, and uh, my son has recently gone there to give a lecture. Uh, my son is Pankaj Kumar Singh, he is additional director general uh, in Rajasthan. So he was also speaking highly of the institution. And uh, I'm sure representing such an institution uh, will hear from you about uh, how this threat can be countered uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, well, ethics and spirituality or any other angle that you may be having on the subject. Well, with that, uh, having completed the introduction, I'll say a few words on the subject, and then uh, one, two, three, four, five. We have five speakers apart from myself. I think if we speak for 12 to 15 minutes, I think that should be fine. Uh, we are, should be, but we have already lost uh, half an hour. So let's make it 10 to 12, then, as uh, Marana Saab says, uh, and then have some time for discussions. Talking of terrorism, see, first thing we have to remember that this is the greatest threat to the security of the country today. India has a plethora of problems, a basket full of problems. You have problems in the Northeast, you have problems in JNK, you have the Moist problem, you have the communal problem, you have the castroids, cost you have the reservation agitation, you have river water disputes, you have interstate, uh, uh, all kinds of problems. But we have problems and problems, but of them, the foremost and the most important one is the problem of terrorism. Why I say this is the most important problem? Because most of the other problems we can tackle. If we have good administration, if we have good governance, we have, if we show foresight, if we show strategic vision, if we are tactful, if we have good policies in place, we can solve the problems. The earlier Prime Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh, repeatedly said that, inter that Maoist problem or the Naxal problem is the greatest threat to the security of the country. I never agreed with it. Why? Because the Maoist problem, I mean, in one sentence, if I were to say, you set your house in order and the Maoist problem will disappear. 
Then when I say set your house in order, why I say that? Because the moist problem is essentially a product of our inefficiency, our bad governance, our failure to address the grievances of the tribals, uh, our poor administ insensitive administration in the, uh, in the central Indian states. It is basically a result of that. So you improve your administration, you improve your governance, you give a sense of justice and fair play to the tribals, address their grievances, and the problem will just wither away. But, of course, it is easier said than done, and so the problem continues with us. But terrorist problem, you may have the best government, you may have the best government, you may have the finest prime minister, you may have the ablest home minister, you may have security forces operating at their top level efficiency. You may have the best intelligence network in the world, and yet the terrorist problem will be there, it will haunt you, it will trouble you, it will bother you, it will rattle you. That is the difference between other problems on the one hand and the terrorist problem on the other. Whatever you do, Whatever may be, the, you may have the finest, you may have the most appropriate policies for them. And yet this problem will be there. Why? This problem will be there because the terrorists are opposed to the idea of India. They are opposed to the idea of India. They want to destroy all that India today stands for. They, will, they want to destroy India politically, they want to destroy India economically, they want to destroy India culturally. They just want to devastate India. They cause incidents in Delhi because Delhi is the political capital of India. There are repeated incidents in Mumbai because that is the commercial hub of India. There are incidents in Bangalore because that is the IT hub of India. They created incidents in Ayodhya and Varanasi, idea being to create a religious divide. So they pick up their targets very carefully. Whatever symbolizes the spirit of India, all the iconic symbols, I mean, the, the Taj Hotel, the, 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 the icons of India, the symbols of India, what represents India, th those are to be picked up, targeted and attacked. That's why I say that the threat from terrorism is the greatest threat to the security of India and that needs to be understood by everyone. Now, it is the greatest threat and yet the problem is we don't have an, a counter-terrorism policy. I mean, what is your counter-terrorism policy? If somebody were to ask the policy makers of India, if somebody were to ask the National Security Advisory Board or the Home Ministry, nobody will be able to formulate that. Why don't we have a definite counter-terrorism policy? Why is there ad hocism about it? If you read the U.S. Uh, annual reports that they bring out, country reports on terrorism, they clearly say this is our policy. Four or five points they have mentioned and they say this is our policy of tackling terrorism. I looked up the internet, the British have a policy, the French have a policy, but we don't have a policy. Even though we have been fighting with terrorism of different shades for the last more than 50 years, we have been fighting, uh, I mean, the, the, the first eruption of uh, uh, insurgency was in northeast, in Nagaland, in, in mid-50s. Since then, we have been battling against terrorism. Terrorism in the northeast, terrorism in, in JNK, terrorism in uh, central India. I mean, we have been battling against uh, I mean, terrorists, insurgents, uh, rebels of different shades. Uh, for the last 50 years, and yet we do not have a well-defined policy. I mean, against the Maoists, we have no policy. 
I remember once as a member of the National Security Advisory Board, we called on the Prime Minister and uh, uh, when I was given to ask uh, some questions, I said, uh, sir, we don't have a policy to deal with the Mars problem. Why don't we formulate one? Mr. Manmohan Singh looked at the then National Security Advisor and said, yes, I think he's right. Why should we should formulate a policy? When I got back to the National Security Advisory Board, uh, I raised this point. I was asked, yes, yes, ha, ha, log, yes, yes, we'll do it, just hold on. And we are still holding on. I do not know why is there hesitation in codifying our responses to a particular situation, whether it's a dealing with terror problem, whether <laughs> dealing with a Mars problem. Uh, we don't have a national security doctrine. If you want, you can download from the internet. I mean, the last time I downloaded, I got US National Security Doctrine signed by Barack Obama. Then I looked up the, the National Security Policy of uh, UK signed by David Cameron, who was then the Prime Minister of UK. But of course, we have no National Security Doctrine to this day. We have no National Security Doctrine. We have no counter-terrorism policy. We have no policy, uh, defined a policy to deal with the Mars problem. Now, this is a great problem. On the one hand, we say terrorism is the greatest problem. On the other hand, we don't have a counter-terrorism policy. Next, do we have a proper law? Now, on having a law, there is so much controversy. I do not know why. This kind of controversy does not exist in any other country of the world. At one stage, we drafted the Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Act, better known as TADA. And that was allowed to lapse. Then came Prevention of Terrorism Act, POTA. That also lapsed. Now we have UAPA, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Mind you, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. We, there was hesitation. I'm sorry to say there was hesitation in calling it Anti-Terrorism Act. Call it un Unlawful Activities. Okay, unlawful activities, so what is your jeep? Your pick pocketing is also unlawful activities. Hai. So, all the jeep cutra, jeep cutra, terrorism, all the other categories are going to go. So, now, what I am saying is that we have had a strange governments, governments which did not have the courage to call terrorism by the name of terrorism. And they said, no, no, don't call it Anti-Terror Act, call it Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Chali, Oh yeah, and the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act also, it has served our purpose so long, but the act is now out of date, I will say. I mean, uh, the, uh, so in several countries, I have uh, information, uh, the Anti-Terror Act is being updated. We are still depending on the old act, and I'm sure when the challenge comes, we'll find that the act is inadequate, enacted as it was, uh, I forget the year, but at most 15 years back, it was enacted. So, the act requires more updating, it requires, uh, um, the need, it needs more teeth, so to say. Because as and when the challenge comes, then you will notice the deficiencies of uh, this act. Now, Uh, about the gravity of terrorism, let us be clear about where we, where we stand globally. Globally, we are at number three in terms of, of countries worst affected by terrorism. It's, mind you, it's nothing to be proud of. The, uh, the worst affected countries, of course, Iraq, and, uh, and then followed by Afghanistan, and number three is India. It's nothing to be proud of that we are almost getting bracketed with Iraq, Afghanistan. And uh, in terms of number of incidents, uh, the number of incidents are going up. Uh, lately, in 2015, we had 798 terror attacks. 2016, we have 927 terror attacks. In 2015, we had 289 deaths. In 2016, we had 337 deaths. Now, this, we are very vulnerable to terrorism. We are having uh, terrorist attacks with great frequency. Now, another, another thing which worries me that 
in the wake of 26-11, after 26-11 happened, the then government uh, worked out a series of measures which, could, which, which were to be taken. They established, uh, they decentralized the deployment of NSG, which was earlier concentrated only in Delhi. They said, no, we should have an NSG hub in Kolkata, in Mumbai, in Chennai, and in, and in Hyderabad also. So NSG units were decentralized. NIA was established. Coastal security scheme was drawn up. States were asked to strengthen their police. Uh, paramilitary forces were asked to make up their shortages. And a multi-agency center was set up to coordinate the work of intelligence. All that was done in the wake of 26-11. It was a package of reforms to strengthen the internal security of the country. But after that, there has been very little forward movement. Why? Is there a sense of complacency? Are we waiting for another catastrophe to overwhelm us? Uh, when we will wake up again and they say, Achha, achha, ab kya karna hai batao. So, but why are we waiting for another disaster to overtake us? The, the problem gets compounded by the fact that our police is in very poor shape. Uh, very poor shape. I have been repeated, repeatedly talking through different fora about uh, the weaknesses of the police and what reforms need to be carried out. Uh, we managed to get orders from the Supreme Court, but the states are not willing to implement those directions. There has been very partial compliance. So police continue, were in bad shape and continue to be bad, in bad shape. And please remember that police are the first responders to any terrorist crime. And if the first response is, in a, is inadequate, inappropriate, or weak, then whatever further measures you take uh, will only partly compensate for that, not fully. First, the, whichever force, whichever agency is the first responder, that must be strong, that must be uh, capable of uh, taking the shock, which it is not. There are several other weaknesses, but I won't be able to go into all those details. But suffice it to say that police are in very bad shape and they are the first responders. Meanwhile, the threat continues to aggravate about the Islamic State. We are repeatedly told by, by the Home Minister, by the Ministry of Home Affairs, they say that a very small number of uh, Muslims have been infected by the ideology of the Islamic State. True. But several experts have in this context pointed out that uh, the, the ideology has infected a large number of people. Many of them have not come out in the open. Many of them have not come out in the open. And uh, the danger of a fairly big section having been radicalized is there. What is the exact percentage? It would be difficult to say. But uh, please remember that even if 0.1% people get infected, that would be, in, in India's population, it, work out, it will work out to a huge number. And uh, uh, lately there have been reports that the Islamic State is planning to attack Hindu religious congregations like the Kumbh Mela. I do not know how, how true is this. Uh, report, but uh, but all these reports should cause concern, and should uh, we, we should not uh, and should we should lead us to shedding any sense of complacency and initiating such measures as are necessary to deal with any threat which may which may be still looming on the horizon, but which could happen any time. A lot of measures need to be taken in terms of strengthening the counter-terrorism apparatus, uh, apparatus uh, which we shall be discussing uh, as the speakers uh, throw more light on the subject. Suffice it to say that the threat of terrorism is very grave, it's very serious, and the kind of uh, uh, measures which should have been taken to strengthen the security architecture, the police, the central armed police forces, the, the intelligence uh, machinery. Uh, that has, that, that's not happening 
and uh, there is inadequate uh, uh, seriousness about it. The, the worst example is the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, which was talked about so much, and then uh, nobody, everybody has forgotten about it. We do need a National Counterterrorism Center. Of, I mean, the bill that was drafted initially, it had certain flaws, and that caused uh, some, uh, that ruffled the feathers of state uh, leaders. Let those flaws be removed, but the NCTC should be put in place. So the threat of terrorism is serious, it's grave, and uh, we need to take adequate measures in good time before any catastrophe overwhelms us again. With these words, uh, uh, I conclude my own observations, and I would now request uh, Air Marshal Roy now like to take the stage. Or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Normally, I would have started my talk by congratulating the GCTC to getting the order of the Army, Navy, Air Force correct. But now that the Air Force speaker has come ahead of the Navy, so we have violated that order. And that's the seniority, Army, Navy, Air Force. Not that the Air Force comes last in battle, if I can dare say, like the police shown in Bollywood movies. At the very outset, let me begin by saying that counterterrorism is a tough job for any nation to be fully prepared. And that it's a constant war against terror and what we can do is improve our capability and capacity as we tread through this war. And in the last decade, the UAVs have contributed in a very big way in this particular war. Originally conceived and designed only to take over the dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks of manned aircraft, the UAVs have gone well beyond their initial brief. And today there is a variety of spectrum of UAVs. I don't know if you're familiar, but I'll just say a little bit about them. The micro UAVs, which are less than 10 grams and less than 15 centimeters, to the mini UAV, which is about 10 kgs and flies still about 200 feet only. And then you have the tactical UAVs and the medium altitude, uh, high endurance and the high altitude. These are the actual ones which are doing all the war fighting. And the world is going further into autonomous UAVs with artificial intelligence. There was a talk here on artificial intelligence by some members. And this autonomous UAV will be fully programmable. It will take off on its own once it is let go and do the entire task, including target identification and also targeted killing, and then come and land on its own without any human intervention. And that is, in a way, dangerous for humanity as such, but those are the other aspects. So how do these affect counterterrorism? So what are the counterterrorism activities? To my mind, those activities related to, say, aviation or activities as such are monitoring the communication of the terrorists, monitoring some particular area where the terrorists may be, tracking a particular person, preempting their actions, preempting a preemptive attack, and now targeted killing. So how does the UAV fit this bill? UAVs have prone to be excellent in surveillance and reconnaissance and a good tool for intelligence gathering and that's what you want for counterterrorism, for target tracking and target designation. This target, target designation is done by the laser beam for other platforms to fire a laser weapon so that it is ex absolutely precise and there is a very little collateral. But now with the armed UAV coming, the revolution has taken place. So what has happened? The sensors which range from the electro-optical spectrum, infrared, synthetic aperture radar, and now something called the LRF, which is for ranging, to find out the distance from the target, and very sophisticated target tracking algorithms. Onto these is fused a weapon. And that's what brings the sensor and the shooter onto one platform. And that is the revolution. 
This sensor shoot up being on one platform makes the UAV available for something that is called as time critical targeting. It's time critical because the person that you're gunning for, the terrorist that you're gunning for is available for a finite time, which is very little. And in that time, you have to go through the cycle. The cycle I will explain so that the missile hits him and you have him killed. This time critical targeting was pioneered by the Israelis. And like the name suggests, you have to kill or you have to get your target no sooner you acquire him. And the person between the sensor and the shooter is the intelligence analyst. Because he has to analyze the target, identify the target, and at the appropriate level, you have to get a decision to go ahead and launch the weapon. And for this thing to happen in that short time frame, the Israelis carry out or believe in persistent surveillance in the air and also on the ground. In fact, by all intelligence agencies. So what do they do? On the Gaza Strip, they have a UAV loitering 24-7. All their ground posts, they have their people, their soldiers monitoring movement across the border. And their aerostat is airborne at all times, day in and day out. With such kind of persistent intelligence, they're almost ready to take the live feed from the UAV and interpret it because they have devices and tools for fast uh, information processing and identification, uh, uh, identification of the target. So it is this time criticality that is important and the most fundamental or the most important or critical issue is the identification of the target. What the Americans and the Israelis have quite understood this and all the success that the Americans have had in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, some of which I will just discuss, has been because they understand this time critical loop time critical targeting loop and what goes along with it. The success has been of the Predator UAV with the Hellfire missile. Because it has all the sensors, it has the missiles and what they've hit upon is quick targeting. The first noted deployment of the Predator UAV was in the elimination of the Al-Qaeda Chief of Military Operations, his name was Mohammed Atif. Mohammed Atif was knocked out in his Al-Qaeda safe home in Afghanistan when the predator was uh, loitering over his house and sending images from Afghanistan to Langley, uh, uh, to CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia on a secure data link for the target to be identified and orders received for a kill. Subsequently, in 2006, the Al-Qaeda leader, Abu Masab al-Zarqawi, was killed in an operation which took 600 hours of surveillance and 10, hour, 10 minutes of two F-16s bombing the place where he was conducting a meeting. So what happened in those 600 hours of surveillance is they formed a pattern of his of his living, of where he would come, where he would appear. And on the 7th of June 2006, when he was eliminated, he was mapped entering that particular room. And with the help of Jordanians and uh, some of the tip off from the Iraqi, all this got materialized, put together. So what is the key here? The key is to understand that your UAV is going to be only as capable as your intelligence. Your targeting will only be as good as your intelligence and we have to get that yeah. act together when I speak about India. The Americans have been using the UAV Predator in Pakistan since 2004. They have carried out about 395 UAV strikes, killed about 2,800 personnel. Out of these, 18% have been leaders. 6% had been civilians, 
to say 6% civilian, that means they have contained the collateral to quite an extent. And the rest of them have been claimed to be militants. In 2004, started by President Bush, continued further by President Obama, till 2011, when it was halted for a little while because of the incident in Salala, when 24 Pakistani soldiers were killed by F-15s and the C-130. And that also happened on the 26th of November. And that is also called as 2611 by their Prime Minister Gilani at that time. I thought I'll just connect the two together because today is 2611. Now, when you analyze the data of the, what the Americans have done and what the Israelis do, you realize that while all this surveillance the UAV will do and the crime criticality of the intelligence is sorted out, most of the help comes from people on the ground. In Pakistan, once the Pakistani government came in conjunction with the Americans, their targeting improved. The Pakistanis had an interest. They wanted the warlords of Tariqe Taliban to be knocked out. In return, they gave to uh, the Americans the information on the Al-Qaeda. Likewise in Israel. Incidentally, I lived in Israel for three years, so I can speak with some uh, first-hand information. In Israel, if there is a target in the fourth car in a convoy, fourth car from the front, then the UAV or the helicopter which is targeting that particular target will hit only the fourth car. That is the kind of intelligence they get, and that is because the, some insider will paint the car with a paint which is not visible to a normal eye. And it is either visible to the UAV through the laser or through any other elect, uh, electro-optics. So you do need some help on the ground, which in our case may or may not be physical. Now I come to the Indian context. There is news that we are likely to get 10 Heron TP. Now the Heron is an armed UAV. Whether we get the armed version or not, I'm not too certain. What the media says that this project has not been approved yet, but it is under final stages of consideration. So maybe we'll have uh, <clears throat> maybe we will have the UAV in our board. So if the UAV is here, then India has another option for the hard kill. We have another option for deep penetration strikes. But what is it that we need to put together? We could take a cue from the Americans and the Israelis because they are the ones who have been using this. For us, it will be a start point. We've already had, we already have on our inventory UAVs which can do the surveillance and recce and laser designation task. But we haven't used it where a manned aeroplane could go and fire. Probably the sensitivity of a manned aeroplane crossing the border and interfering into the sovereignty of the other country, in our case, is very high. It's not with the Americans and the Israelis. So whatever we learn from them, we have to modify it to our environment. But what we do need is one body which has to have the overall control of what I call the Odin tasks. Odin is for observe, detect, identify, and neutralize. It should be done by one agency. In Israel, the Shin Bet does it. In, uh, for the Americans, it is the CIA, SAD. That is a special activities division. They are the overall bosses. So like that, we have, like so, we have to have one agency. Then we need software automation so that the identification can be done quickly. We need a battery of dedicated intelligence people at all levels where decision making is to be done. And a secure data link so that with enough bandwidth so that the UV imagery can come down. Then we can build the capability by and by, very much with persistent surveillance like the uh, Israelis. Though our UAV may not be able to fly 24-7 in uh, the enemy's territory because our situation is different. We have to find a way around that. Once the drone surveillance is done and the uh, pattern of the terrorist movement carved out, we are ready to hit. So what I want to say is definitely the UAV gives a soft option 
for handling the terrorists on the ground. And this must be utilized because there are many other advantages. Firstly, no human lives are lost. Secondly, surgical strikes are more doable now and deep into enemy territory where manned aircraft may be barred. Into those areas where special units may probably not go. And UAVs are a low cost option. A UAV costs about one tenth or one fifteenth that of an aircraft. And finally, the UAV sends a very powerful signal of intent. And it is time India sent the intent. Finally, I want to say that the value of a weapon lies in how it is used to deliver the overall political message. With the armed UAVs in India's fold, India can certainly convey that it cannot be pushed around however high the level on the ground may be. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy and feeling so proud for being in front of all of you today. Thank you so much, GCTC, for invite, inviting me for this Global Counter-Terrorism Conference. Friends, I can see a common passion and synergy in all of our thoughts to secure ourselves and our nation from this ever-evolving cyber threats. You know, cyber security and cyber threat is not a new thing. I feel there are some myths associated with this. And the main myth is what we feel we all are safe. We all feel that we feel we are safe. We all understand the importance of cyber security. We all acknowledge cyber threats. But still we feel we are safe. We feel we do not have any important data. We feel these cyber threats are for big organizations, not for as we as an individuals. We feel why somebody will attack us. Or we feel we are not seeing any attack happening to us. Dear friends, if we are not seeing any attack, if we are not seeing any attack, this does not mean that we are not being attacked. Maybe we are not able to identify or see that attack. You know, we all use computers. We all use mobile devices. We all use smart devices like smart AC, smart car, smart refrigerator. So we all are the users of the cyber world. And remember, cyber world is a full of threat. You know, we all agree that internet has become a very important part of our life. Remember time of 10-15 years back and compare it to the present time. Actually, internet has changed our life. It has changed the way we think. It has changed the way we live. It has changed the way we communicate with each other. It has given us many advantages. But there are many challenges associated with it also. Sometimes I feel internet has given us more challenges than its advantages. You know, just to give you a few examples, to understand the gravity of cyber threat, in one of the case, a smart TV of a particular house was used to hack the Wi-Fi of that particular house. What we do when we need any information, we go to the Google and we put our search on that. So whenever we do any search, Google always collects a lot of individual informations and this information was sometimes being misused also. I think social media, how many of you are not on social media? Please raise hands. None. Very few. We all are, most of us are on the Facebook, Twitter, so many social medias. And friends, we ourselves give a lot of information about ourselves on the social media. About our movements, about our resume, about our date of birth, everything. Many times it has been observed that hackers used social engineering techniques 
on the social media platform to get important information about individuals. Friends, whatever we see on the internet, whatever we see on the www internet explorer, whatever we see on the internet is just the 4% of the internet. The remaining 90%, 96% internet is a deep world. It's a dark web, which cannot be accessed by a normal user. It can be only accessed by onion browser. This 96% deep web is a totally anonymous. It cannot be used by a normal user, but it is highly used or misused by the hackers. Hacking has become a very well organized, relentless, very sophisticated and even sometimes backed by the nations also. You know, today, technology and information are the new mantras of this digital transformation. Business is being transacted at a lightning speed. Billions of dollars are being transferred digitally from one part of the globe to the other part of the globe. So this transition from industrial era to information era has created a lot of new cyber security threats. You know, if we have to divide our world into two major parts, we generally divide into developing nations and developed nations. With large scale of automation and a highly use of ICT, developed nations are, used, are enjoying a very beautiful life. But due to high use of this automation, there is a major cyber security threat associated with it. On the other hand, rising aspirations and low cost of ICT use has created a different kind of cyber security threat for these developing nations. So no one in the world has left. Cyber security is a global problem. Thanks to our PM, we have projects like Digital India, a smart city, which will have a direct impact on the governance, transparency and accountability. But please think, a cyber insecure Digital India, a cyber insecure smart city, it can paralyze the complete country with just a single click. Hence, it is very important, very important that security should be the design parameter for any project, any solution. Friends, world is moving very fast, very fast. We can hear some kind of cyber incidents on an everyday. Sometimes we heard of cyber attacks also. I feel in case of any future war, any future world war, it will be a cyber war. You know, national and economic well-being of any country depends on its ability to effectively manage its critical infrastructure. Cyberspace is one of the most critical infra infrastructure nowadays. When it comes to, you know, preparation to handle those or to face the cyber criminals, there is no substitution to it. Human is the weakest link. Yes, I repeat, human is, is the weakest link in the cycle. Hence, cyber security awareness training plays a very important role to secure any organization. Friends, future will be whatever, we will make it. We all can see a exponential growth is happening on this digital, digital digitalization. We all agree this digital technology have directly impacted our day-to-day -day life. Hence, our traditional ways of thinking about the future are not good enough. You know, by nature, human think by nature, by na nature, human is the always think about comfort in a sorry. By nature, human always feel comfortable in a stability, but Digital economy is not of this. It is ever evolving and it is changing every moment. So digital economy can be either opportunity or it can be threat. With digitization rapidly changing so much rapidly, it is always good for better seeing the future than everyone else. On this day, once we are celebrating 9th anniversary of 2611, 
I have no better message for all of you that this country belongs to all of you. We are a proud citizen of this country, which is the greatest country on this world. To counter cyber, cyber terrorism, it is, it is important that we all, corporates, corporates, armed forces, government, we all have to do, do our own stake, our own, our own efforts. For progress of our country, we need to prepare ourselves by being, to, be, to get informed. So, be focused, be determined and be cyber aware of this world. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sodhi, for enlightening us on an area which is becoming increasingly important, increasingly critical for not only our security, but I would say to our very existence, in fact. Because uh, considering that network and cyber and internet and computers, this has become an integral part of our life. And we are all in it. Whatever you may say about the threats, you know we are we are all on social media. I mean, social media was at one stage hailed as a great uh, uh, force, educating people, bringing bringing people together. But uh, the other day there was an article that social media is becoming a great threat to any democracy. It all depends on, actually it all depends on how you use a weapon. And if the social media is misused and abused, then the consequences can be very grave. That apart, uh, the cyber world has its own mysterious uh, area also. I refer to you briefly as dark web, uh, which as you said, 94, that is 94% of the total uh, net. We, we are able to access only 6%. God knows what is there in the remaining 94%. And I am given to understand that a lot of drug smuggling, um, smuggling of weapons, organized crimes in the form of trafficking in women, all that takes place through the dark web. And uh, you can transfer weapon from one country to another. You can transport drugs from one part of the world to another through the dark web and uh, things which are not available in the market and uh, which are prohibited. If you have, can access the dark web, you can just place your orders and it will be delivered to you. So, these are areas about which we do not know much, but which have profound consequences on the, on our day-to-day -day life and our, and on consequences for the security of the state. Well, with that, uh, uh, we now move on to the next speaker. May I now request uh, go to the other extreme and request uh, Dr. Pankaj Gupta from the OP Jindal Global University uh, to throw light on the subject. Yeah, very good evening to all of you. Uh, <clears throat> again, it is a matter of great uh, happiness for me to be here and I want to uh, thank Mr. Adil Tadiku uh, for inviting me here. And very nice to hear very distinguished views of the other speakers. Uh, I may be a little bit of misfit in this panel because uh, I have never done those kind of counter-terrorism or those kind of operations. But I deal with you know, a lot of youngsters all over the world. Uh, I was also taught in many countries in the world. I was also earlier in UP cadre officer. And uh, then on my own, I'm in this academic industry. So <clears throat> my perspective is like this. We all know uh, in the corporate that there is something known as a cost of quality. Uh, whenever there is a matter of you know the repair or you know the warranties or ill will, that all that is what we see is known as an external failure. And when this failure is detected, when it is right there in the factory, it is known as a uh, internal failure. When it goes out of the factory, it is an external failure. We, we know many examples like the Volkswagen and other things that how the lack of quality impacted the companies in a big way. But how these internal and external failures can be handled is by the good old principle of uh, prevention and appraisal. So even for this 
counter-terrorism also I would like to, uh, my talk would be mainly in context with the uh, prevention and appraisal that how it can be done. See, whenever we talk about um, terrorism, then we also need to look into the thing that nobody is born as a terrorist. We must see that there are certain situations in life which make a person uh, radical or terrorist. We need to understand that. Um, when I was director of Symbiosis Bangalore, we did a study. At that time, Mr. Dion Session was on my board. And we did a combined study of, you know, uh, with a certain terrorists which were lost in the Bangalore jail. So we wanted to find out what is in the mind of a terrorist. And our students went and met, you know, a lot of terrorists there. And, uh, you know, we had many findings. We also published a paper. But one of the very interesting findings was that uh, many of the terrorists which were lost in the Bangalore jail at that time, they were engineers. So we also, and also we know that the 9-11 other thing also, there are many engineers, uh, you know, who were, who later became the terrorists. So we wanted to went on to study and find out that whether the engineering education make a person terrorist or what is the, you know, correlation in the two. And uh, though there are so many reasons for that, but one of the very obvious reasons which came to our mind was when you look at the education system, and especially if you look at the engineering stream. So there is a very, all the time you see it is more of a causal relation. You know, if you do 2 plus 2, you will get 4. You will do this, this, then you will get this. So that means you are having a very set kind of pattern. If you do this, 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 then you will get this. And this is the truth. That is the only truth in life. So whenever we have this kind of tendencies, we must be very careful. One of the author has said many, many years back, that somebody who does not smile, somebody who does not speak, somebody who doesn't like music, you should be very careful about that person. So, in the same way, these kind of tendencies, you can very well make out, if you look at you know, the history of the person who became a very direct terrorist, what happened in his or her life, uh, when that person was a child and what happened. Because everybody, when you also study the victimology, there is something known as a victim mindset. So person is, you know, given a make-believe kind of situation. Oh, you have been repressed. You have been done this, this, this. So many wrong things has happened to you. So either it is an impact of the past, which is grilled down the line. Whenever any, you know, wrong stimulation is there, there will be somebody who is there to manipulate him or her. Oh, you know, because so-and-so are not nice to you, so it is happening this way and that way. So impacting them all the time and manipulating their mind by giving a lot of so-called wrongdoing in the past or telling somebody, oh, you know, if you even die, tumhe hoor milengi jannat mein. Ye hoga, wo hoga. So either playing on the future or creating with the past. And second thing is that you talk about uh, this is it, that kind of attitude. So, <clears throat> my humble submission is that, because I do a lot of, you know, training and consulting and mentoring all over the world. So, what I believe that the holistic education is a way forward. And, you know, even in this kind of situation like this is it, there is so much reliance on the left side of the brain. You know, and the right side of the brain, there are different faculties which is the, are for the chanting, the music and dance. Those are not developed. So in order to become a holistic human being, it is very, very important that we should be having both sides of the brain. We should be engaging the student right from the beginning that how we can engage students in a holistic way rather than creating, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. If you are not doing it, then you are missing something. So these are the wrong way of nurturing a child. And somehow in our education system, we are more driven by either abhav or prabhav Abhav means, you know, there is something missing in me, so you need to do this. You also see the economic background of the people who become terrorists. You know, they were not given any importance in life. A lot of, you know, those situations were there. So they say, okay, if you do this, mm -hmm. then we will take care of your entire family. You will be called a Shaheed. And, you know, we will take care of you not only in this life, but also in the afterlife. Prabhav means where they have been shown a lot of, you know, radicals, you know, what happened to them. And uh, so sometimes they are also being influenced by that. So they never get an opportunity to work in their sobhav. 
So, so how means what is the natural purpose of your life? What you are capable of becoming? Somehow our education system is not geared towards that. And secondly, this whole concept of, you know, that how we create a right and left side of brain combination. And uh, even in the Hindu philosophy, you see that uh, if, you, if you look at our goddess of wisdom, Saraswati Ji, uh, then you see that she has got three symbols. One is a Veena. Veena symbolizes the Gan. Then there is a Pustak, that is Gyan. And then you have a Mala, meditation, that is Dhyan. So there is a nice combination of the Gan, Gyan, and Dhyan that also talk about the holistic knowledge and holistic education. But somehow, whenever the student is coming, you know, post, uh, you know, class 12, 10th, there is a tremendous pressure. If you do not become a IAG, then your life is useless, this and that. So we need to look into the whole education system in a different way. And we should see that how these small, small things which are leading to a radical mindset, how this can be taken care of. And also, when we are nurturing our children, you know, we should be careful. If there is a, uh, our child who is showing these kind of attributes, then they have to be handled with love, with compassion. And uh, because many times the values, we teach something, but these values are not taught. They are actually caught. So therefore, we as uh, uh, elders, we have a lot of you know, roles to play. And uh, so I think the way forward is, that how we can engage students uh, right in the present. And one of the very important uh, tool which is being used uh, all over the world is known as a mindfulness. That how we train people into the mindfulness, heartfulness, meditation. So that can make a very, very important part so that the people are going more on the <clears throat> sodharma and they are able to expand their level of consciousness when they see that uh, you know the same divinity and same uh, thing is there in everyone. Then you are not going for uh, dwat philosophy. You are going more towards uh, advaita. Advaita is like invoking oneness within. And uh, many a time people are just running and running and running, but they do not know why they are running. And are they running in the right direction? So in that way, because most of the answers which we try to find out is more of the external. If I get this, then I'll be happy. If you kill this, then you will be happy. But there is no attempt being made towards the inner journey that you are already happy, successful right now. And you see that there are a lot of research happening in US universities on the Ubuntu principle. It is not about you know one person winning and others losing how we all can collectively win. And we talk about the SDG goals and you know, sustainability goals and so on. But we do not make attempt towards a sustainability, sustainable mind. Because without a sustainable mind, you cannot create a sustainable world. So in the same way, what I'll say that though the attempts are very well made, that when there is a failure, then how to handle that. But more important than that is, where are the seeds, where is the factory of those kind of seed of terrorism coming there? And though the entire world may not be in our control, but the India has been always a big knowledge leader. So can we again bring those practices of mindfulness, heartfulness, the gan gyan dhyan, and you know, removing away this you know, kind of abhav and prabhav, and how we go for the sobhav, so that will create a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. That was indeed a new dimension uh, to the problem of terrorism that we need to ensure at the very beginning that the boys and the girls, both sides of the brain are adequately developed. Uh, I don't think any attention is being paid to it. Unfortunately, you see that in most, most of the institutions which are coming up in urban areas, they are just like shops. Uh, which have been set up in an urban conglomeration. There is no playground, there are no facilities for outdoor activities, just study, 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 that's it. Most of the, very, very few institutions have a place for outdoor activities. So, this is not a very healthy situation, as brought out by Professor Pankaj. 
we need to ensure all-round development of a child uh, so that his personality really evolves, really blossoms, really flowers in a multifaceted manner. And the chances of his going adrift or taking a wrong direction are to that extent minimized. Well, now we, now may I request uh, Vice Admiral Pradeep Koshiva to speak to the state and speak on the subject. Good afternoon, everybody. How do they say it in the airlines nowadays? Good afternoon, boys and girls, the chair, and fellow panelists. Um, since today's uh, conference is uh, coincident with the 2611 uh, terrorist attack at Bombay, I will give a brief recap of that to start with, uh, even though most of the details are well known, so that you can relate to whatever I am going to mention in the context of maritime terrorism to the end. And the recap is 10 members of lashkar e taiba carried out 12 coordinated shooting and bombing attacks starting 26 November 2008. They killed 166 people, wounded more than 600, 300 of them seriously. They had been trained in LET, basic combat training, advanced commando training by ISI, and former Pakistan Army officers and Marine Warfare Training. They were transported across the sea from Karachi. They hijacked an Indian fishing trawler, Kuber, killed the crew of four, and forced the captain to sail to Bombay. About seven kilometers short of Bombay, they killed the captain, came out in two mechanized dinghies, and drove on to a beach in Cuff Parade area. After landing, they were accosted at least by one and maybe a couple of more people. This old lady asked them, who are you and what are you doing? And they told her, squarely, mind your own business. And she, poor thing, minded her own business. They were also accosted by others. They took taxis and transports and moved on. Now, this was the background when they went across and went out to the country, and that's all the details are known. Now, some numbers. Uh, around 80% of global trade goes in cargo ships, tankers, and some 15 million containers. They all move in 50,000 ships, which make 200 million port calls in a year, using 2,800 ports globally. Maritime transport, therefore, is the backbone of international trade and global economy. And ports and harbors are hub of the 21st century mercantilism. Sea is an eminently suitable medium for gun running, for clandestine movement of terrorist carters from one century to another, for smuggling of narcotics, transporting levels of mass destruction, and for disruption of economies of a nation, of a region, or even the world. Distinctive features which directly impinge upon operations at sea are that maritime vehicles operate in a very unique medium. Uh, on one hand, the sea surface is a featureless environment, it's flat, calm, and there are no hill features, no high ground, no trees, no buildings, no nothing out at sea, on behind which, under which, on the side of which, somebody could hide. But below the surface, there are transports, subsurface transports, which can move around freely, and that provides a large room for concealment and stealth. Littoral seas are very, very crowded space because of convergence of oceanic transports, offshore economic activity, coastal trade, fishing fleets, etc. And therefore, identification of who is who is very, very difficult. Even on radar, there are small images which paint. You do not know who is what unless there are some equipment which is used to do that. Sea-based threats can develop via surface, subsurface, or an airborne platform. Therefore, a typical sea perimeter would be a surveillance area, area which is way out, in which space-based airborne, airborne or surface, subsurface, ground-based capabilities are deployed to find out who is coming in, then you detect them, you track it, identify, and then neutralize the threats. 
a very important dimension to remember is that all terrorist activity starts on land, even though 70% of the earth area is covered by water. Theoretically, a developing coastal security threat can be successfully intercepted and neutralized anywhere. Preferably, farther out, the better it is. But the highest probability of doing this, that is, detection, identification, neutralization, is about 50 kilometers out at sea, from there onwards up to 5 kilometers inland. Governance and administrative rules which apply across this stretch, that is from 50 kilometers out at sea to 5 kilometers inside, they range from international laws to municipal laws, in between covering central, state and local government enactments. In our own country, there are up to 22 different ministries and departments which can be involved in securing India's coast. These include the Coast Guard, Directorate General of Shipping, Directorate General of Lighthousing, Port Control Authority, Marine Police, Customs, Marine Immigration, Intelligence Bureau, etc., etc., Narcotics Control, Health Authorities, Fisheries, Municipal Corporations, and so on. Now, let's take a slightly closer look at the challenge of terrorism from the high seas. This is twofold. One is it starts from land. It gets transported across the sea or by air or over sea surface and is committed at sea against ships and offshore platforms. These are handled by navies and coast guards because these are activities out at sea. The second one is also it starts from sea but it gets transported over the sea and then is committed on land, the kind of which I have just described of 2611. This is where all agencies participating, they start with intelligence to maritime security perimeters of Navy and Coast Guard, and they are handled, once the terrorist lands on the ground, it is handled like any other terrorist activity on land. In addition to the professional agencies, every citizen has a contribution to make in this activity with utmost civic sense, social responsibility, and personal discipline. To satisfactorily meet these challenges, we need to seriously set our own house in order, as Sri uh, Prakash Singh had just mentioned uh, at the in the introductory remarks, to put the house in order first and foremost. After 2611 attacks in Mumbai, the Cabinet Committee on Security had given wide sweeping directions. They constituted an apex committee under Cabinet Secretary, they made committees uh, 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 under MHA, committees in states, etc. And all these very comprehensive orders have been given. Even Raksha Mantri holds periodic meetings and takes uh, stock of what is being done at the national level, at the state level, and at the local levels, from starting in the state, from chief secretary to the district ministry. They've all been set up. All external terrorism in this time and age is, in fact, either state sponsored state supported or state tolerated. Very few independent uh, activities take place. Nation states in all these categories need to be isolated through effective counter-terrorism measures at the local, sub-regional, regional and national levels. The success of all complex endeavors is entirely dependent upon professionalism, commitment and diligence of every participant either individually or institutionally and actually both. Individuals contribution can be directly enhanced through awareness, education, training and personal ownership of civic as well as professional responsibility. In the business of national security, no citizen is a passenger. Each one needs to lend a shoulder and they should do so with pride and national responsibility. Institutional contribution, contribution requires clear-cut charter of duties, assignment of responsibilities, chains of command. Put together, these should be visible as coherent structures with gapless coverage and adequate overlaps, but without any confusion about jurisdictions of space, time or task. Planning to meet the challenges of terrorism is coordination activity, which can be done well from sectarians. But combating terrorism, irrespective of its origin, is operational activity, which can only be act, commanded and controlled from operational centers. Blurring of lines between these two can have fatal security lapses. Now, if you see against this backdrop of seriousness of what I just mentioned, 
I just bring out three small issues which are still pending to indicate as to where we are in the process of taking charge of these. Implementation of some of the most major decisions of the group of ministers based on recommendation of the Carville Review Committee are still pending. Case for empowering Coast Guard under MZI Act of 1976 for foreign flag vessels for board search and seizure operations being pursued by MOD are still being looked at MEA. And whole host of actions which may be turned as works in progress but could do with a lot of professional focus, operational priority and seriousness are still going on. I have not gone into numbers of the platforms which have been acquired, the radar chains which have been established, all that a fair amount has gone on in question and answer session. If required, I can bring out some of that data. But suffice it to say, if the question is asked in one word answer, uh, are we ready to meet the challenges of terrorism from the sea? I'm afraid I do not know. We are ready, we think we are, but unless we are tested, we won't know. But one thing one can say with absolute certainty that we could do with a lot more seriousness from the apex level downwards. Actually, everybody down the food chain takes inspiration and directions from upper levels of the chain. And therefore, it is at the upper echelons that we need to be absolutely clear about the direction we are going, have clear-cut mandate on that and work accordingly. Thank you all very much. Which is really uh, a matter which should cause concern because it is nine, about nine years that we drew up a comprehensive coastal security plan which was to be implemented in three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. Now, they, if you go through the MHA's annual report, they say phase one is complete. Now they are working on phase two. But whatever information I also get from the field, our coastal security is far from uh, foolproof. And uh, the, weakest, the weakest link is the maritime police, which has not really come up. It was supposed to be a three-tier security, Merit, maritime police, coast guard, and Indian Navy. The Coast Guard and Indian Navy are doing their job, but maritime police has not come up yet. And they are still discussing whether <laughs> there should be a central armed police force uh, specially entrusted with the maritime, poli maritime police duties, or it should be handed over to Coast Guard. So these discussions are still going on. The, the point to worry is that coastal security has yet to be, uh, the coastal security scheme has yet to be fully implemented. And uh, we are, cannot be confident on the coastal security arrangements as they are today. Uh, that's how it is. Now I come to, uh, I now shall request Maulana Madni, who is a liberal Muslim voice, to throw light on the subject because <laughs> terrorism attracts a lot of people and uh, a lot of people over whom he, he can, over whom he would then his voice would have a sobering influence. Professor Madni. Malana Madni. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Aap logo ko adab karna chahta hai. Prakash Singh sahab se bhoat purana tarlo hai. और जब मैंने सुना कि इस सेशन को प्रकाश सिंह साहब चेयर कर रहे हैं तो मुझे यकीन हो गया कि ये बैठना फायदेमंद होगा जो बातें मैं करना चाहता हूं उनमें से अक्सर बातें आ चुकी हैं अब मुझे कहने के लिए बहुत ज़्यादा नहीं है लेकिन जब और कुछ नहीं है तो उनमें से कुछ बातों से बात को शुरू करूँगा मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि टेररिज्म के तीन चार पार्ट हैं काउंटर करने के एक इंटेलिजेंस से रिलेटेड है जो सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट है कि आपकी इंटेलिजेंस मजबूत होनी चाहिए तो बहुत सारी चीजों को होने से पहले रोका जा सकता है दूसरा है होने के बाद का फॉरन एक्शन कि आप 
लोगों को पकड़ेंगे करने वालों को लेकिन उससे ज्यादा करवाने वालों को देखना है वो उसके लिए एक लॉन्ग टर्म स्ट्रेटेजी की जरूरत है करने वालों को पकड़ेंगे और सजा दिलवाएंगे जिसकी तरफ प्रकाश सिंह साहब ने भी तोज्जो दिलाई कानून के हिसाब से एक्शन के हिसाब से इसमें यहाँ मौजूद लोग जो हैं उनका इम्पोर्टेंट रोल है होने के बाद और होने से रोकने के लिए ये दोनों तीनों काम मेरी समझ से शॉर्ट टर्म और मिड टर्म है लॉन्ग टर्म जिसके लिए एक लॉन्ग टर्म स्ट्रेटेजी की जरूरत है वो है उस पोजीशन को होने न देना कि जिससे लोग इसमें इन्वॉल्व हों वो कैसे रोका जाए जैसे अभी फरमा रहे थे प्रकाश सिंह साहब के आप मुसलमानों के हवाले से ऐसा ख्याल था कि ये ठीक है कि डायरेक्टली बहुत ज्यादा लोग इन्वॉल्व नहीं हैं लेकिन ये समझ लेना कि लोगों का नजरिया आइडिया ऐसा नहीं है या उनमें शिद्दत शिद्दत को इंग्लिश में नो एक्सट्रीमिज्म कहें शायद वो ज्यादा एक्सट्रीमिज्म भी परफेक्ट नहीं है लेकिन शिद्दत का मतलब होता है कि थोड़ा मिडिल पाथ से हट जाना सोच के हिसाब से तो वो एक बड़ी पॉपुलेशन है ऐसा समझा जाता है कि एक बड़ी पॉपुलेशन है जो शिद्दत पसंद हो गई है एक्सट्रीमिस्ट हो गए हैं और ये फर्स्ट स्टेज होता है उसके बाद टेरिज्म की तरफ आदमी जाता है जब तक के एक्सट्रीम नहीं एक्सट्रीमिज्म नहीं पैदा होगा तब तक वो टेरिस्ट नहीं हो सकते जान देने का जज्बा जैसा कि आप कह रहे थे कि या तो जन्नत मिलेगी या पहले से कुछ प्रॉब्लम है तो मैं इसे थोड़ा सा डिफर करना चाहूँगा ये ठीक है कि जन्नत मिलने की तमन्ना जो है वो आदमी को लड़ने के लिए और मरने के लिए तैयार कर देती है ये ठीक बात है बिल्कुल अच्छा अब ये तमन्ना आती कहाँ से है ये रिलीजियस बैकग्राउंड होगा तो ही आएगी रिलीजियस बैकग्राउंड नहीं होगा तो ये क्रिएट होगा फिर भी लेकिन कम लोगों में होगा ज्यादा वही लोग इससे अफेक्टेड होंगे जिनका बैकग्राउंड रिलीज है अब हम इंटरनेशनली अगर देखने जाएंगे और यानी ग्लोबली भी और डोमेस्टिक जो हमारा नेशन वाइड जो हम देखते हैं कि अपने कंट्री के अंदर जो टेररिज्म आ रहा है मुसलमानों के टेररिज्म के हवाले से तो मैं ये देखता हूं कि जितने लोग इन्वॉल्व नजर आ रहे हैं उनमें से 70 परसेंट से ज्यादा वो हैं जिनका बैकग्राउंड रिलीजियस नहीं है लेस देन 30 परसेंट ऐसे लोग हैं जो रिलीजियस बैकग्राउंड से आते हैं कश्मीर को थोड़ी देर के लिए अलग कर दीजिए क्योंकि कश्मीर तो इंटरनल इशू से ज्यादा एक्सटर्नल इशू है बाहर का इंफ्लुएंस है कश्मीर में ज्यादा और वहां यूज हो रहा है रिलीजन का वो बिल्कुल ठीक है लेकिन अगर कश्मीर से बाहर के जितने बड़े इंसिडेंट्स देखेंगे वो इंडियन मुस्लिम्स की तरफ से जितने बड़े आप इंसिडेंट्स देखेंगे ये मेरा परवेज मुशर्रफ साहब से भी वहां मेरी इसी बात पर हुई थी कि वो ये कह रहे थे कि इंडियन मुस्लिम्स के साथ क्यों के जस्टिस नहीं हो रहा है इसलिए इंडियन मुजाहिदीन इन्वॉल्व है सारी चीजों में आप पाकिस्तान को बिलावजी खड़ा करते हैं कटघड़े में तो मैं वापस जाता हूं उस बात पर कि हमें ऐसा लगता है कि ये चीज जरूर कहीं ना कहीं काम करती होगी लेकिन जब हम इंडिया के टेररिज्म को देखते हैं और इंडियन मुस्लिम्स की तरफ से टेररिज्म में इन्वॉल्वमेंट के किस्से को देखते हैं तो उसमें रिलीजियस बैकग्राउंड का पार्ट जो है वन थर्ड से ज्यादा नहीं है टू थर्ड से ज्यादा ऐसे लोग हैं जिनका कोई रिलीजियस बैकग्राउंड नहीं इवन प्रैक्टिस भी नहीं है जितने लोग मारे गए पकड़े गए इन्वॉल्व नजर आए ये अलग बात है कि वो 
اس کا قصہ بھی الگ ہے خیر تو میں ایک بات یہ کہنا چاہتا ہوں دوسری بات ڈفرینٹ شیپ کے ٹیرزم ہمارے ملک میں ہے کشمیر کا ایک الگ ٹیرزم ہے نقسلائٹس کا ایک الگ ہے اور مجھے ایسا لگتا ہے کہ ہر ٹیررسٹ گروپ کو کاؤنٹر کرنے کے لیے شارٹ ٹرم اور مڈ ٹرم پالیسی کے لحاظ سے تو کوئی رعایت نہیں ہونی چاہیے اس کو آئن ہینڈ کے ساتھ ہینڈل کرنا چاہیے لیکن لانگ ٹرم پالیسی جب ہم بنائیں تو ہمیں اس کو سافٹ اور خوبصورتی کے ساتھ اور اس میں ایک ہومینیٹیرین پہلو ہونا چاہیے یعنی سیملٹینیسلی آپ کو دو ٹریک پر کام کرنا چاہیے چاہے آپ نقسلائٹس کو ڈیل کر رہے ہوں چاہے آپ کشمیریوں کو ڈیل کر رہے ہوں اور چاہے آپ اور چھوٹے چھوٹے جیسے نارتھ ایسٹ کا پرابلم ہے یا مین لین میں جہاں ایک سو پچاس ملین مسلمان ہیں اس ملک میں منیمم یہ تو ایک سو چالیس ایک سو پچاس کا فیگر تو اس کا ہے اب اس اتنی بڑی فیگر کے رہتے ہوئے اور ٹیگ تو یہی ہے نا کہ مسلمان کا مطلب یہ ہے میں بہت اپنے ایک ریسپیکٹڈ دوست کے ساتھ بیٹھا تھا اور سینئر آفیسر ہیں وہ کہہ رہے تھے کہ تم لوگوں نے اس ملک میں گند پھیلا رکھی ہے تو میں نے کہا میں نے بالکل اس کو مان لیا کہ ہاں ہم نے گند پھیلائی ہے اس ملک میں لیکن آپ کو یہ سمجھنا چاہیے اور مجھے سمجھانا چاہیے کہ یہ کس ٹائپ سے مسلمانوں نے اس ملک میں گند پھیلائی ہے اگر آپ ویسے بات کر رہے ہیں مسلمانوں کی کہ بھئی مسلمانوں کے محلے گندے رہتے ہیں مسلمانوں کے گاؤں گندے رہتے ہیں سفائی فائی کم ہے ذرا مسلمانوں میں ذرا کیا زیادہ ہی کم ہے تو اس لحاظ سے تو بالکل ٹھیک ہے لیکن اگر دماغ کی گندگی کے لحاظ سے دیکھ کیونکہ دماغ پہلے گندا ہوگا تبھی آدمی ایکشن لینے پر آتا ہے اور تبھی وہ جنت ونت ڈھونڈنے لگتا ہے اگر کسی کو دنیا کی جنت مل جائے اور میں ایمانداری سے کہتا ہوں کہ جس جو جس آدمی کے اندر انسانیت ہے اس کو پرماتما کہیں ایشور کہیں بھگوان کہیں خدا کہیں اللہ کہیں گوڈ کہیں کوئی کچھ بھی کہیں اس کو دنیا میں ہی جنت ملنی شروع ہو جاتی ہے اور جس کے دماغ میں گندگی ہوتی ہے اس کی دنیا پہلے جہاں میں بنتی ہے بعد میں اس کو وہاں نرک ملے گی جو کچھ ملے گی مرنے کے بعد تو میں یہ لانگ ٹرم کی بات کر رہا تھا کہ لانگ ٹرم اسٹریٹیجی جیسا کہ شکایت تو سبھی کی ہو گئی ہر 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 جتنے آسپیکٹ ہیں ٹیررزم کے یا اٹیک کے اصل تو اٹیک ہو رہا ہے ہمارے اوپر کنٹینیو اٹیک ہے باہر سے اور اس میں پاکستان بھی ہے اور چائنا بھی ہے میں معافی کے ساتھ کہنا چاہوں گا کہ آپ کے لیے جتنا پاکستان کرتا ہے اس سے کم نہیں اس سے زیادہ چائنا انفلیس کرتا ہے اس بات کے لیے کہ کس طرح سے انڈیا کو ڈیسٹیبلائز کیا جائے اب ہمیں میں واپس اس پر آتا ہوں اب یہ میں زیادہ چائنا کی بارے میں بات کروں تو اس کا مطلب یہ بالکل نہیں نکالنا چاہیے کہ پاکستان نہیں کر رہا ہے پاکستان بھی خوب کر رہا ہے اور اس کو جتنا موقع ملے گا کرے گا ہمیں اپنے آپ کو بچانا ہے تو بچانے کے لیے ہمیں لانگ ٹرم اسٹریٹیجی کے تحت کمیونٹیز کو انوالو کرنا چاہیے اور ایک دوسرے کے ساتھ کے بیچ میں جو گیپ پیدا کرنے والی جتنی چیزیں ہیں ان کو منیمائز میں مانتا ہوں کہ گیپ پیدا کرنے والی ساری چیزیں ختم نہیں کی جا سکتی لیکن ان کو منیمائز کرنے کے اوپر سیریسلی کام کیا جانا چاہیے ایک عجیب بات ہے کہ لگتار کوشش ہو رہی ہے کہ مسلمان کو ملک سے شکایت ہو جائے شکایت یعنی کمپلین وہ مسلمان ویسے بھی کمپلیننگ پوزیشن میں ہے ہمیشہ جب بات ہوتی ہے تو کمپلین ہی کرتے ہیں اور اس کو بڑھایا جاتا اس کو بڑھانے کی بہت اچھے سے کوشش ہو رہی ہے بہت اچھے سے کوشش ہو رہی ہے 
چھوٹے چھوٹے انسیڈنٹس ہوتے ہیں اور وہ بڑے نظر آتے ہیں بڑے دکھائے بھی جاتے ہیں بڑے نظر بھی آتے ہیں اور کچھ ہو بھی رہا ہے اس ہونے کو روکنے کے لیے آپ لوگوں کو کوشش کرنی چاہیے اسلام میں میں ایسا سمجھتا ہوں کہ اسلام میں کمنلزم کی کوئی گنجائش نہیں ہے کیونکہ کمنلزم ہوگا تو وہی ایکسٹریمزم آئے گا کیونکہ وہ کاؤنٹر پروڈکٹیو ہوتا ہے خود مسلمان کمیونلزم کرے یا ادرس کمیونلزم کرے اور یہ عجیب بات ہے انڈیا کی یہ اسپیشلٹی ہے کہ یہ ملک میرا ملک یہاں کے لوگ بائی نیچر سیکولر ہیں اب وہ سیکولر اور کمیونل کی جو ڈبیٹ ہے وہ بھی ایک الگ ڈبیٹ ہے اس وقت اس کا موقع نہیں ہے لیکن یہاں کے لوگ لوگوں کو کسی نے بنایا نہیں ہے سیکولر بلکہ یہاں کے ڈی این اے میں سیکولرزم ہے تو اس اس پر کام ہونا چاہیے خود مسلمانوں کے بیچ میں بھی اور ادرس کے بیچ میں بھی کہ اس کو انہینس کیسے کیا جائے اس اسپیشلٹی کو جس کو ہم پرانی چیزوں سے بیان کرتے ہیں اور ایک آخری بات میں کہنا چاہوں گا کہ میں جہاں تک سمجھا ہوں ریلیجن جو ہے مذہب جو ہے وہ اگر اس کو صحیح طرح سے صحیح جگہ پہ رکھا جائے کوئی بھی ریلیجن ہو تو اس کی وجہ سے کمیونٹیز کے بیچ میں کھائی نہیں پیدا ہوگی بلکہ اسی کو برج کا کام اسی کے ذریعے سے برج کا کام لیا جا سکتا ہے اگر اس کو صحیح طریقے سے ہینڈل کرنے کیا جائے اور کرنے کے اوپر کام کیا جائے بہت بہت شکریہ شکریہ احمد صاحب آپ نے بہت اچھی اچھی باتیں کہیں درباگ سے یہ اچھی باتیں آج کے یوا ورگ کو کہنے والے آپ جیسے بہت کم نیتا ہیں اور اس لیے جب غلط آدمی وہاں پہنچ جاتے ہیں تو یوا ورگ بہکاوے میں آ جاتا ہے مجھے یاد ہے لکھنؤ میں مجھے ایک مسلمانوں کے مجلس میں بلایا گیا سارے نائنٹی نائن پرسینٹ سب مسلمان ہی بیٹھے تھے پہلے تو مجھے بڑا عجیب لگا کہ یہاں کیا بات کری جائے نہ کری جائے پر پھر میرا جیسا سبا تھا میں نے وہاں بھی کچھ باتیں وہی کہیں جو مجھ میں سمجھتا ہوں ستیہ ہے اور لوگوں کے سامنے شیشہ رکھنا بہت ضروری ہے جو دیکھیں جب میں تو دیکھتا ہوں جب میں چھوٹا تھا تو جو سوہارد جو سدھاؤ ہندو اور مسلمان میں تھا وہ دھیرے دھیرے کیوں کم ہوتا گیا کیوں کم ہوتا گیا سالوں سال کم ہوتا جا رہا ہے اس کے لیے ذمہ دار کون ہے ذمہ دار ہم سب ہیں اس کے لیے ذمہ دار سب سے پہلے تو ہمارے نیتا ہیں جنہوں نے مسلمانوں کو یہ سمجھ رکھا ہے کہ ان سے ہمیں ووٹ لینا زیادہ ضروری ہے ان کے اندر ہم کیا بھاونا کیا وچار ڈالتے ہیں اس سے کوئی فرق نہیں پڑتا الگاؤ کی بھاونا ڈالو یہ ڈالو کہ ان سے تمہارا خطرہ ہے اس لیے تم ہم کو ووٹ دو یہ جو مسلمانوں کے دماغ میں سالوں سال ڈالا گیا ہے وہ زہر اس کا دشپرنام ہم دیکھ رہے ہیں پھر کچھ اور باتیں ہیں جس کو آپ کی کمیونٹی کو سوچنا پڑے گا جو مدرسہ سسٹم آف ایجوکیشن ہے یہ دو دن پہلے دلی کے مدرسوں کے حالت لکھی تھی کہ یہ لڑکے کتنے لاکھ لڑکے ان مدرسوں میں پڑھ رہے ہیں اور ان کا کوئی بھوشیہ ہے ہی نہیں کسی نے اس کا بشلیشن کیا تھا کیونکہ ان کو سوا اردو پڑھائی جا رہی ہے اور قرآن پڑھایا جا رہا ہے وہ وہاں سے پڑھ کے نکلیں گے تو کہاں جائیں گے جب تک ان مدرسوں میں آدھنی شکشا کا پٹ نہیں ہوگا تب تک یہ لڑکے کیسے آگے بڑھیں گے میں نے اس بیٹھک میں بھی کہا تھا آپ کے سامنے بھی گزارش کروں گا جو لوگ کہتے ہیں کہ اس دیش میں آدمی کو کیول پڑھ لکھ کے یوگیہ ہونا ہے میں تو دعوے کے ساتھ کہتا ہوں کسی کمیونٹی کا آدمی ہو مسلمان ہو سکھ ہو عیسائی ہو جین ہو ہندو ہو پڑھ لکھ کے اگر وہ بریلینٹ ہو گیا تو اس کو آگے بڑھنے سے کوئی طاقت نہیں روک سکتی کوئی طاقت نہیں روک سکتی اور ابھی ابھی تو کئی بار مسلمان ایک دم ٹاپ کی پوزیشن پہ آ رہے ہیں آئی ایس کے امتحان میں کیونکہ انہوں نے پڑھنے لکھنے کے وہ دھیان دیا 
पर अगर आप उनको पढ़ाएंगे ही नहीं अगर आप उनको कूप मंडूप में रखेंगे कुएं के मेढक की तरह रखेंगे तो बेचारे जाएंगे कहाँ उनकी शिक्षा प्रणाली में बहुत परिवर्तन की जरूरत है बहुत सारी बातें हैं इस संबंध में पर मैं यही कहूँगा कि आप अपना जो संदेशा है उदारता का भारतीयता का भारत में अच्छे इंसान की तरह रहने का वो अगर लोगों नौजवानों तक तो पहुंचाते रहें तो बहुत बड़ी बात होगी वरना जो एक्सट्रीमिस्ट हैं वो गलत संदेश बराबर देते जा रहे हैं और उसका दुष्परिणाम जो है वो जो फासले हैं वो बजाय कम होने के बढ़ते जा रहे हैं फिर कुछ और संस्थाएं ऐसी हैं तबलीग की संस्था है कौन है इन्होंने आपका पहनावा ही बदल दिया बीस साल पहले हम मिलते थे मुसलमानों से तो जब तक उनका नाम ना पूछें ज़्यादा डिटेल में बात करें पता ही नहीं चलता था कि वो हिंदू हैं या मुसलमान हैं उनका पहनावा वगैरह सब हमारे जैसा था पर कुछ लोग आए उन्होंने कहा नहीं अपना पहनावा बदलो इस तरह का पैजामा पहनो इस तरह की टोपी पहनो इस तरह के बाल रखो अब वो अब तो मैंने उस मीट, मीटिंग मीटिंग में भी कहा कि भाई हम तो सौ मीटर दूर से समझ जाते हैं कि ये आदमी हिंदू है या मुसलमान है पहले तो हम उसके साथ बात करते थे तब भी नहीं पता चलता था थोड़ी देर बात करने के बाद पता चलता था कि नहीं ये भाईजान हिंदू नहीं है मुसलमान है पर कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ा ठीक है बड़ी इंसानियत के रिश्ते से बड़ी अच्छी बातें होती थी अब सौ मीटर से ही फासला शुरू हो जाता है कि भाई ये तो वैसा आदमी आ रहा है तो ये जो अलगाव की भावना हुई है उसमें कुछ तो आपके जो जिन लोगों ने ये रिलीजियस इंस्ट्रक्शन इस तरह के इंस्ट्रक्शंस दिए हैं कि ये पहनावा पहनो बाकी लोगों से अपनी पहचान फर्क बनाओ ये भी बहुत हद तक जिम्मेदार है जहाँ तक देशों का सवाल है मैं समझता हूँ हिंदुस्तान जैसा उदार देश तो कहीं दुनिया में मिलेगा नहीं और अकबर जो मंत्री हैं केंद्रीय मंत्री मंडल में हैं उन्होंने उन्होंने कहा है एम अकबर ने एक जगह कि दुनिया में हिंद मुसलमानों के लिए हिंदुस्तान से अच्छा रहने का देश कोई नहीं है जो फ्रीडम आपको मुस्लिम बाहुल्य देश में नहीं मिलती है जो मौके आपको मुस्लिम बाहुल्य देश में नहीं मिलते वो सब हिंदुस्तान में खुला है तो ये सब बात समझने की जरूरत है और ये जो विक्टिम हुड की फीलिंग है कि यहाँ हमारे साथ बेइंसाफी होती है अन्याय होता है इस सब इस सब बातों से ऊपर उठने की जरूरत है अन्याय तो देखिए सबके साथ होता है आप जाइए हिंदू इलाकों में जाइए पचास पचासों आदमी मिलेंगे जो कहीं हमारे साथ बेइंसाफी हो रही है पर इसके हमारे ये नहीं कि हथियार उठा लिया जाए और देश के खिलाफ बगावत कर दिया जाए तो इंसाफ के लिए आवाज़ उठाने की जरूरत है खैर ये विषय बड़ा लंबा है आ, आ, सभी विद्वान वक्ताओं ने अपने अपने विचार रखे हैं ऐसे समय तो साढ़े चार का खत्म हो चुका है फिर भी अगर कुछ दो चार प्रश्न हैं तो हम लोग उसका जवाब देना चाहेंगे जो लोग भी प्रश्न पूछना चाहें पहले अपना नाम बता दें और प्रश्न अगर किसी विशेष स्पीकर से पूछना चाहते हो तो पूछें वरना सवाल पूछे जो जवाब दे सकता है देगा जी फ्लोर इज ओपन फॉर क्वेश्चन एंड आंसर्स like you talked about you know uh, terrorism in north east but uh, can we uh, formulate a single law for all those terrorist activities like you know uh, or insurgent groups which are in north east and some uh, terrorist groups which are from outside india like you know lashkar e taiba or uh, al qaeda or any uh, any other uh, uh, terrorism terrorist groups So is that possible a single law, you know, to uh, incorporate all this group because all of them are driven by different re, uh, forces, like you know, political forces or social or you know, religious uh, kind of forces. You see, there are certain things which are difficult to define, but they are not difficult to understand. 
If you want to define terrorism, then there is problem. Because as they say, one man's terrorist can be another man's freedom fighter. But what are the broad features of terrorism? About, about that is a general agreement. That one, two, three, four, this is what constitutes an act of terror. An act of terror would involve an act of violence. It would be against the established order. Uh, so, and the terrorist may be drawing his inspiration from a religious text. So, the broad features of terrorism are known. But the, when you come to defining it, then there are all kinds of problems. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to define terrorism. So, and that is why the United Nations has, although it has been grappling with this problem for long, long years, but they have not been able to define terrorism. But the fact that you are not able to define terrorism does not mean that you cannot formulate, codify, or define your response to this problem. You know what is terrorism. Everybody knows what is terrorism. Something happens and they say it's an act of terror or it's not an act of terror. That's, there's no, no difficulty in identifying an act of terror. So what should be your response to that terror? That needs to be codified. And that is where, as I said, a policy needs to be formulated. And the policy will be of a general term, which would be applicable to different shades of terrorist groups. Thank you so much. Sir, I also have an uh, agreement. I'm so uh, sorry. A course uh, of Yeah. Uh, to Madani sir, he said that, uh, you know, uh, secularism is in our DNA. But I would, like, I'm afraid that, you know, I would not agree with you on this because the very word secularism or secular uh, was incorporated in our constitution in the 42nd amendment, which is uh, like two, almost three decades after, you know, uh, adoption of our uh, constitution. So I think uh, in this case, British uh, policy, which tried to divide us, and you know, this policy of divide and rule, I think it was very successful and uh, it's still there. Because I, I have worked with people, uh, uh, I mean, uh, who follows Islam, and you know, before working with them, the concept I had was like different. But then while I worked with them, it was different because it, they were working for interpret dialogue and everything. I was different. So I think, yeah, uh, I would not agree with you on that. that secularism was in our DNA. Yeah, secularism was our DNA. Even not. Look, secularism, if there is a long debate, it is not a small thing. और आपका जो डिफरेंस है उसको भी मैं मान लेता हूँ उसको उसको रिजेक्ट करने की कोशिश नहीं करूँगा लेकिन मैंने ऐसा समझा है कि जो इस 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 इंडियन सब कॉन्टिनेंट में जो मजहब फॉलो किया जाता है रिलिजन फॉलो किया जाता है वो रिलिजन ही सेकुलर है मैं इसके इसको और आसानी से कहना कहना समझाने के लिए कहना चाहूँ दोबारा दूसरे अंदाज में कि हिंदुत्व की बात होती है अगर वाकई रियल हिंदुत्व आ जाए तो उससे किसी दूसरे रिलिजन को कोई खतरा नहीं हो सकता इसी तरह अगर रियल इस्लाम हो तो उससे किसी दूसरे इंसान को किसी दूसरे रिलिजन को कोई खतरा नहीं हो सकता खतरा वहां होता है जहां रिलीजन का इस्तेमाल पॉलिटिकल पर्पस से किया जाता है वो एज ए टूल यूज करते हैं रिलीजन को हिंदुत्व खतरे में है या इस्लाम खतरे में है वो अपना अपनी मर्जी खतरे में जा रही होती है उसकी तो वो इस्लाम के नाम को या हिंदुत्व के नाम को इस्तेमाल करता है तो जब हम पुरानी तारीख पर जाते हैं बल्कि अभी भी जो बिल्कुल रूरल एरियाज में चले जाए जहां इन्फेक्शन कम है भी ज्यादा नहीं हुआ है स्पेशली हिल एरियाज में तो आपसे कोई जान पहचान नहीं है आपकी कोई कोई इंट्रोडक्शन नहीं है आप पहुंच जाएं तो अपना घर खाली कर देंगे आपके सोने के लिए आप मेहमान हैं जो अभी शहरों से और कॉमन एरिया से चली गई है कोई कोई अब आपका रिश्तेदार भी आए आपके पास मेहमान तो यानी वेलूज चली जा रही है मेहमान रिश्तेदार भी आए तो बोझ लगता है पहले खुशी होती थी कि मेरे घर देवता आ गए तो इस तरह से बहुत सारी चीजें हैं ऐसी हैं जो इफेक्टेड हो गई हैं और चेंज हो गई हैं उसी में ये भी है तो अगेन मैं ये कहना चाहूंगा 
کہ ریلیجن کا اور سیکولرزم کا کوئی ٹکراؤ نہیں ہے بلکہ اگر اگر صحیح معنوں میں کوئی مذہب کا ماننے والا ہے فالو کرنے والا ہے کسی بھی مذہب کا ایماندار ہے اس کے پیچھے پولیٹیکل مقصد نہیں ہے کوئی تو وہ بیسٹ سیکولر آدمی ہو سکتا ہے All the religions are good and they teach good education, everything. My question is with the panel, particularly Mr. Madni. Of course, uh, there are certain good and bad things in our religion. But generally, if you see in totality, religion, they teach good things. But the public perception, particularly in our country, is if you see there are more bad elements are in Muslim religion. Here my uh, request for the question is, why are the good people, religious people who have influence, why don't, don't they come together to teach them good education? Uh, like uh, in introducing uh, address uh, Mr. Prakash Singh told that the bad people, they influence them more, but good people, they left behind. So my question is, why good people? And I believe that number of good people will be certainly more than that of bad people. Why don't all, uh, all of them, they don't, uh, they don't come together and teach their investors? What is happening is communication gap is very big. Now, in the past 2007, the most big organizations of Muslims انہوں نے ٹیررزم کے خلاف جھنڈا بلد کیا ہوا ہے آپ کو معلوم ہے کہ اس ملک کے ایک جگہ چھ ہزار مفتیوں نے جمع ہو کر ٹیررزم کے خلاف فتوہ دیا ہے نہیں معلوم آپ کو نہیں معلوم کہ پوری دنیا میں ٹیررزم کے خلاف پانچ سو لوگوں کی سے زیادہ کی کہیں کانفرنس نہیں ہوئی دنیا میں لیکن آپ کے دیش میں لاکھ لاکھ لوگ ہاف ملین لوگوں کی بھی ہوئی ہے اور ایسی ڈیڑھ سو کانفرنسیں صرف دو سال کے اندر ہوئی ہیں دو ہزار آٹھ میں اور دو ہزار نو میں جس میں پبلک باہر نکل کے آئی ہے دیکھئے پبلک کا سوچ یہ ہے کہ مسلمان مسلمان کی سوچ آپ سمجھ رہے ہیں پرکات سنگھ صاحب بھی سمجھ رہے ہیں میں بھی یہی سمجھ رہا ہوں کہ مسلمان کی سوچ یہ ہے کہ یہ اٹیک ہوا ہے بمبئی کا یا کسی بھی جگہ کا وہاں سے وہاں بارا اچھا ہوا ٹھیک علاج ہو گیا ان کا ٹھوک دیا ٹھیک علاج ہو گیا یہ ایک سوچ ہے ہماری بھی یہ سوچ ہے کہ مسلمان ایسی ہی سوچتا ہے لیکن ہیدر آباد بینگلور بمبئی اسی بومبے میں اسی چھبیس ایلیون کے موقع پر سارے مسلمانوں کے قبرستان والوں نے ایک ساتھ منع کر دیا کہ ہم ان کو یہاں دفن بھی نہیں کرنے دیں گے اپنے ہاں اور اسی بومبئی میں یاکوب میمن کے جنازے کے لیے ہزاروں لوگ نکل کے آگئے تو دو الگ الگ طرح کے قصے اسی ایک شہر میں نظر آتے ہیں تو الگ الگ طرح کے حالات ہوتے ہیں الگ الگ طرح کی چیزیں ہوتے ہیں ایک ساتھ قلب کر دینے سے مشکل کھڑی ہو جائے گی ایک بار دوسرے اگن میں واپس جاتا ہوں اسی جگہ پہ اور بس ایک منٹ میں ختم کر دیتا ہوں اپنی بار کہ یہ جو اچھی چیز ہوتی ہے کومیونٹی میں اس کو میڈیا اگنوم کر دیتا ہے میں جو بات بولتا ہوں وہ نہیں دکھایا جاتا میں نے ایک بات کہی پونے میں چھتر پتی شیو جی مہاراج کے بارے کسی نے اس کو نہیں کیا کیونکہ وہ بات پوزیٹیو تھی وہ بات ان کے آنر اور عزت کے لیے کی جا رہی تھی اس کو اگنور کر دیا میں نے شری رام چندر جی کے بارے میں اور شری کرشن جی کے بارے میں وہیں ایک بات کہی جس کو سب جگہ آنا چاہیے تھا لوگوں کو معلوم ہونا چاہیے تھا کہ ہم شری رام چندر جی کے بارے میں کیا سوچتے ہیں شری کرشن جی کے بارے میں ہم کیا سوچتے ہیں ہمارا اسلام ہمیں کیا سکھاتا ہے کہ ہم ان کو ان کا نام کیسے لیں ان کے یہ ایک ہمارے مذہب نے سکھایا ہم کو ہمارا قرآن نے سکھایا ہمارے رسول ہمارے پروفٹ نے پندرہ سو سال پہلے سکھایا اب وہ بات میں ایک کہہ رہا ہوں وہ ایشو نے اگر میں کوئی ایسی بات کہہ دوں جو انریزنیبل ہو وہ یہاں بھی اگر ابھی کہہ دوں گا تو وہ نیوز بن جائے گی بس یہ پرابلم ہے جس کی وجہ سے پتہ نہیں چل رہا ہے 
वरना बहुत बड़ा एफर्ट हुआ है और इसके पीछे बड़ी ताकत लगाई गई है और मुस्तकिल काम हो रहा है रेगुलर काम हो रहा है आज भी हो रहा है कल में परसों रात में धुलिया में था महाराष्ट्र क्योंकि वो काफी अफेक्टेड है एक खास सोच के लोगों से तो वहां पे हमारा काम चल रहा है दुनिया में था अमन और एकता सम्मेलन के नाम से हमने सम्मेलन किया और लोकल रिलीजियस लीडर्स को बुलाया उसके अंदर उस इलाके के जो साधु संत है वो भी सब आए क्या शानदार प्रोग्राम था वो अभी दस दिन पहले बाईस कितना वो उनतीस सत्ताईस अक्टूबर को हमने यहाँ दिल्ली के इंदिरा गांधी इंडोर स्टेडियम में जो सबसे बड़ा इंडोर स्टेडियम है वहां पचास हजार से ज्यादा लोग जमा हुए और सारे रिलीजन के लोग भी थे और सारे मुसलमानों के सेक्ट भी थे और एक साथ हाथ मिलाकर खड़े होकर के ये अहद किया है कि आपस के गेप को कम किया जाएगा और साथ मिलकर काम करेंगे कहीं नहीं कहीं नहीं आपके आपके कैपिटल में एक एक ऐसी गैदरिंग हो रही है जिस गैदरिंग में 99 परसेंट मुसलमान है और जिस गैदरिंग को एड्रेस ऋषिकेश से अकाल तख्त के जत्थेदार आ रहे हैं वहां से लद्दाख से वो जो सबसे बड़े प्रीस्ट हैं अपने सेक्ट के बोध वो आ रहे हैं ऋषिकेश से स्वामी चिदानंद आ रहे हैं और ये अलग अलग ख्याल के लोग हैं और एक साथ एक प्लेटफॉर्म पर इकट्ठे हो रहे लेकिन अपनी मीडिया से गायब ना सोशल मीडिया में है और ना कन्वेंशनल मीडिया में तो ये वीकनेस है ये वीकनेस है इसके ऊपर काम होना चाहिए सर जैसे अभी बहुत सारे स्पोर्ट्स पर्सन होता है खास करके जो बूढ़ों की बात होती है कि आप मारेंगे कितने बूढ़े मिले मैं कहता हूँ कि तमाम धर्मों में इस प्रकार की कुछ ऐसी चीजें आती है जो अनुभक्तों को खास करके विश्वास हो रहा आम आदमी को विश्वास नहीं होता लेकिन खास करके इस मामले में जो आतंकवाद के क्षेत्र में जाते हैं उनके बारे में बहुत इसकी चर्चा होती है तो ऐसा इसके खिलाफ आप लोग बोले और उसको थोड़ा सा पब्लिसाइज भी करें जिससे लोगों को लगे कि नो दिस इज नॉट करेक्ट और खास करके जो साइंटिफिक टेम्परा में जितना डेवलप हुआ है और लोगों का विकास इस ढंग से हुआ है कम से कम इस तरह की सब चीजों में विश्वास न करें वो बात आपकी सही है ये अगेन मैं एक बात अजीब कहूंगा कि वही वही उसी बात पर अटकी हुई है मेरी सुई और आपकी सुई भी उसी बात पर अटकी हुई है कि ये वहां से रिलीजियस उससे लिया जाता है देखिए इस दुनिया में सबसे पहले इस्लामिक स्टेट कहाँ बनी है कहाँ बनी है सर कहाँ बनी है इसी इंडियन सब कॉन्टिनेंट में बनी है जी वो तो सेकेंड थर्ड है इसी इंडियन सब कॉन्टिनेंट में सबसे पहले इस्लामिक स्टेट बनी है अच्छा ये जुमला मैंने सुना है एमजे अकबर साहब से वो कहीं विवेकानंदा फाउंडेशन में बोल रहे थे वो मैं भी मौजूद था वहां तो कह रहे थे तो मुझे भी समझ में आया कि बात सही कह रहे और आइडिया कौन लेके आया था जिसका रिलीजन से कोई वास्ता नहीं था कहीं से कहीं तक कोई वास्ता नहीं था और उस आइडिया को अपोज जिन लोगों ने किया वो सब रिलीजियस बैकग्राउंड के लोग थे मौलाना जैसे मौलाना आजाद का नाम लिया जाता है उन्होंने चाहे पॉलिटिकल रीजन से अपोज किया हो लेकिन बैकग्राउंड उनका रिलीजन था मौलाना हुसैन अहमद मदनी ने बैठकर उसको अपोज किया है उस आइडिया को ही उस आइडिया को ही अपोज किया है रिजेक्ट किया है और पूरा रिलीजियस बैकग्राउंड है उसका आपको मैं पेश करूंगा तो अगेन और भी बहुत सारे एग्जाम्पल्स में दे सकता हूं इस बात के लिए इंटरनेशनल टेररिज्म में भी और इंडिया के टेररिज्म में भी कि रिलीजियस बैकग्राउंड के लोगों ने टेररिज्म को सपोर्ट नहीं किया है अब जहां तक सर ने वो सवाल उठाया है मदरसों का सिस्टम ऑफ एजुकेशन का मुसलमानों के पहनावे का और एक खास आइडेंटिटी बनाए जाने का तो मैं इनसे क्या नाम है आदित्य जी से कहूंगा इसके लिए एक अलग सेशन रखें तो मैं उस पर बात करना चाहता हूँ मेरे कुछ ऑब्जर्वेशन है कुछ सर तो बहुत सीनियर आदमी हैं तो इनके सामने तो हम काउंटर तो कर ही नहीं सकते सीखने के लिए कुछ बातें करना चाहूंगा मैं तो आदित्य जी आपके जिम्मे आ गया ये मतलब हम लोग फिर बिठाना है अलग से खास खास मुसलमानों के इस इशू पर देखिए मैं इसमें एक बात बोलना चाहूंगा मैं आजकल एक कोर्स पढ़ाता हूँ पहले मैं आई बीन ऑलवेज प्रोफेसर ऑफ फाइनेंस एंड अकाउंटिंग एंड आई ऑल्सो रन ओनली फॉर द एक्सटर्नल वर्ल्ड टिल आई गॉट समथिंग इन माई लाइफ एंड आई वेंट टू हिमालय फॉर मेनी ईयर्स एंड देन आई केम बैक so i now teach a course which is known as self awareness and inner joy and this course has uh, the prescribed reading including bhagavad gita bible quran bulle shah rumi 
uh, Meera. So I see that, you know, in my course, everyone is there. And we try to bring out, you know, what is the good from every religion and how, you know, they are leading to the same thing. We also practice meditation. We talk about, you know, the same divinity, divine light is within you. So I think we need to have more such kind of a thing. Because, you know, earlier when I was knowing about, uh, only hearsay about Quran, but when I actually read it, when I discussed with a lot of, you know, the Muslim scholars, and I found that there is no, uh, they were just painted like villain, just like that, only for the political reasons. And just as you don't look into the eyes of the person, and many of the things I can quote from Quran, which are as good and as uh, humanistic and kind as they can be, be it a Buddhism model or Zen model. So I believe that this kind of, uh, rather than telling somebody like a moral teaching kind of a thing, it should be more of a value based and the value clarity so that people get more of a scientific temper and that can make a big difference. Thank you. With that, with that, we come to the end of this session, and I thank uh, all the panelists for their uh, very valuable contribution to the subject, and also the audience for their patience and for putting up very inquisitive questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.